um, hello everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Today, as part of the 2021 Virtual Sacramento Archives Crawl, the Yolo County Archives will be hosting a presentation from Floyd Shimamura with Emily Masuda titled Preserving Perseverance, the Japanese American Community of Winters. This presentation is adapted from an exhibition that is currently on display at the Winters Museum and will discuss the ways in which the history of the Japanese American community of Winters has been preserved over the years. Floyd and Emily will be highlighting archival records, family collections, and the role of retelling historical narratives to younger generations. Before I introduce our guests, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that this virtual program is taking place throughout the unceded territory of California, home to nearly 200 tribal nations. As we begin this event, we acknowledge and honor the original inhabitants of our various regions. A land acknowledgement is a critical step towards working with Native communities to secure meaningful partnership and inclusion in the stewardship and protection of their cultural resources and homelands. Let's take a moment to honor these ancestral grounds that we are collectively gathered upon and support the resilience and strength that all indigenous people have sown worldwide. Yolo County is on the traditional unceded territory of the Ochidehi Winton Nation. Now, I would like to introduce our speakers for this afternoon. Floyd Shimamura grew up in Winters and is third generation Japanese American. He was educated at UC Davis, including its law school. During his legal career, he served as a state attorney and administrative law judge in Sacramento and a law professor at UC Davis. He also served as the national president of the Japanese American Citizens League in the 1980s. He is now retired and enjoys travel and volunteer work. Emily Masuda has taught English as a Japanese exchange and teaching program in Gif Gifu, Japan and at Winters High School. Her involvement with the Historical Society of Winters began when she reached out about teaching the history of the Japanese families to her high school students. Luckily, the Historical Society was working on an exhibit for the Winters Museum about this lost Japanese community. Having a strong interest in telling stories, real and imagined, she volunteers for the museum and as co-director of the Stories on Stage Davis and is currently a graduate student in the MFA program in creative writing at UC Davis. Lastly, before we get started, I wanted to remind you all to ask questions at any time using the chat function down at the bottom of the screen. Um, and we will get to as many questions as we can at the end of the um, presentation. So um, thank you so much uh, for joining us again. And I will pass it over to Floyd to start the presentation. Thank you very much, Heather. Uh, I guess you can put up the first slide. Okay, this is the, the name of our presentation. Preserving Perseverance, the Lost Japanese American Community of Winters. Uh, next slide. Okay. Uh, this slide shows the exhibit at the Winters Museum titled The Lost Japanese Community of Winters. It spans about 100 years from 1888 when the first Japanese arrived in Winters until 1988, when their descendants helped achieve redress for the unjust incarceration after Pearl Harbor. Uh, it is a purely local history with all the photos, artifacts, and stories directly related to the Japanese who lived in Winters. Uh, next slide. Okay, the, the first part really focuses in on the Issei, and I'm focusing in on uh, the, the first settler. Uh, we, this, in this brief presentation, we'll, we will only focus on about three matters. First, finding the first Japanese settlers in the 1890s. Second, the recovery of a 1930 Japanese school photograph. And third, uh, Emily will talk about uh, my involvement in redress in the 1980s. Okay, let's uh, start with how we found our first settler uh, next. Well, 
I did a little research and uh, there's a book called the Issei uh, by Yuji Ichioka. And uh, on page 80 of his book, he made the surprising statement. The Japanese entered California agriculture in 1888 when a few student laborers worked as field hands in winters near Vacaville. Uh, next slide. Well, I, I know we have a lot of archivists on hand today and uh, like any good researcher, I wanted to check uh, Mr. Ichioka's authority for that statement because I never was aware, even though I grew up in Winters, that Winters was the first place where uh, Japanese farm labor actually began. And so I, I looked at the Winters Express dated May 12th, 1888. Now that's the local newspaper here in Winters. And uh, this is what it said. And I think this is what uh, Ichioka was relying on. He said that after the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, um, a number of winners growers, notably the Brink Brothers and G.W. Thistle, uh, had employed Japanese help and are satisfied with the experiment so far as they have gone. So in 1888, uh, the Brink Brothers uh, had an experiment going and they brought in some Japanese workers. Uh, next slide. So uh, let's begin with uh, the Brink brothers. Uh, what kind of farming were they up to? Well, it turns out that in 1888, the same year that they did this experiment, bringing in Japanese workers, uh, a professor at Berkeley wrote a book about the Vacaville Winters Early Fruit District of California. And uh, what he said was, uh, it was a very unique area from a uh, agricultural standpoint because it's fruit like apricots, peaches and, and whatnot, uh, uh, ripened about a month earlier than any other fruit in the state of California. And that the winters area, which is the northern part of the uh, Vaca Valley area, uh, was the uh, earliest of all by maybe four or five days. And he attributed that to the fact that Vacaville and winters uh, uh, were in an area where the ocean breezes uh, from the Bay Area uh, collide with the uh, warmer uh, breezes from the Sacramento Valley. And, and the confluence of that in and out motion uh, creates a special uh, ecosystem. Uh, next slide. Th the next question is, okay, we know about the Brink brothers, but what about these uh, student laborers that Ichioka talked about. Uh, where do they come from? Well, it turns out that um, uh, there was a person named Waichiro Honda in, Wa in the Wakayama pre Prefecture of Japan who was encouraging students to come to Sacramento or Sacramento and San Francisco to um, learn more about uh, uh, the United States and American culture. And he said that the best way to do that was to work as a houseboy, like in, in San Francisco, where you could live in, do your domestic duties during the day and take classes at night. And, um, so it was really from this group of students uh, who uh, the Brink brothers ended up uh, recruiting for their 1888 uh, experiment. And later statistics shows that 
by 1895, uh, seven years later, there were 450 Japanese uh, low, uh, residing in the Vaca Valley area, 80% from Wakayama. And from this uh, uh, statistic, I, I think Ichioka uh, makes the connection between the student laborers uh, coming from Wakayama and, um, and the Brink brothers. And e even up, up until World War II, 80% um, of the Japanese in the winter's area was from Wakayama. And in fact, from two very small villages. Uh, next slide. So when we put up the uh, lost uh, exhibit in June, the, the earliest Japanese immigrants we could identify uh, arrived in 1898, uh, 10 years after the Breeding Brothers experiment. In fact, my maternal grandfather was one of those who arrived in 19, uh, or in 1898, and his name was Toyokichi Wenishi. Um, but uh, what about that 10 year gap between the 18, 88 experiment and uh, uh, the arrival of my, my uh, grandparents and his friends uh, 10 years later. Uh, I think the question was, was the Brink Brothers experiment a one and done, but nothing really uh, flowed from that particular uh, episode? Uh, so what happened? And uh, uh, in this, um, uh, and then this is when something extraordinary happened. You know, we, we put up the lost exhibit in June. Uh, and at that time, uh, we had a reception. And one of the former residents named Jasko Takahashi uh, said that, hey, she had some photographs that she would like to share with us. Uh, be, and so she scanned some photos. And, and sent them in, and this is one of them. And she said that this, in this picture, her grandfather, um, who became known as um, uh, uh, George uh, Takahashi, is the gentleman standing in front of the wagon towards the middle, and the Japanese woman is named Asano uh, Takahashi and is his wife. So, you know, we got back to Yasko and we asked her, well, who, who were these, um, the, the white folks in the uh, photograph? And she said she didn't know. And then we asked her, uh, when was the photograph taken? And she said she didn't really know. So that kind of made me think at that point, hey, you know, maybe this is the Brink brothers. And um, so I did some uh, research and from the mountains and background, I knew it was from the Apricot district west of Winters because in the lithograph that I just showed, you know, it, it clearly shows the Berryessa gap. I also knew it was taken in June because of the apricot shrine on the trays in the background. It, you, you can't see it in this photograph, but it, they're just in front of the, um, the horses. It's a little bit dark on, on my screen, but you can see it in the real photograph. Uh, finally, I, um, I knew that uh, electricity came to Winters in 1905. And so that electrical pole indicates that this photograph must have been taken after um, that day. So who were the people? Could they be the Brink brothers? After checking the 1910 census, I discovered that August Brink, the younger of the two brothers, had three young daughters of grammar school age named Elise, Pearl, and Grace. Now this was in the 1910 census. Bingo, 
it must be the Brink brothers, I thought. Looking more at the 1900 census, 10 years before that, I, I learned that George Takahashi had arrived in 1892, had learned English and was essentially the foreman of the Brinks Brothers Ranch. And uh, the big thing to me was that he had learned English already because it's well known that it was the farm laborers who learned English, they, they were the ones who became foremen because they could uh, negotiate and speak to the white growers and also uh, recruit and select the best Japanese workers. And um, so initially I thought that um, based on all this information, uh, this photograph was taken in 1908 or so. Uh, but then I learned that Asano, uh, uh, Yasuko's uh, grandmother, had returned to Japan in 1907, a year earlier, and had her first child in December of 1907. So I became convinced that this picture was actually taken in 1907 in June. And um, in Japanese American history, 1907 is a significant year because it is the year when the gentleman's agreement was signed, which stopped further immigration of Japanese farm labor in the US. And um, and um, so that made me wonder, uh, uh, and, and, and the, the other thing that was uh, uh, unusual about this picture is that Asano herself was even there because prior to 1907, uh, like 95% of the Japanese farm workers were young males. Uh, there, there really were no women. And the 5% uh, that were women, um, I think were there more for to entertain the young men than anything else. So, so Asano was probably one of the first uh, married women to, uh, to come to Winters. The, the other thing that was astounding about this picture is that it's a picture that shows both the Japanese workers as well as the, the white growers and their families all in one photograph. Uh, I am also on the collections committee for the National uh, Japanese American Museum in Los Angeles and uh, quarterly, you know, I'm part of a review team that uh, um, makes a decision or, or recommendation on whether things should be accepted by the museum for its collection. And I've never seen a photograph like this from that time period. Um, uh, one, because uh, there's a married woman in it, but also because um, uh, it's taken uh, together with both the growers and, and the labor laborers uh, at the same time. Uh, and then it suddenly dawned on me, 1907, and this is really because when I showed this to Emily, who will be coming on soon, I, I mentioned that I thought maybe it was in 1907 now. And she said, was the one who said, oh, that's, that's when the gentleman's agreement was signed. And that's when the light bulb went on. Th this photograph was obviously taken by a professional photographer. And, um, you know, the Brink brothers were always very innovative. I mean, that's why they did the experiment in 1888 with the Japanese uh, student workers. Uh, and they knew that now 
uh, the Japanese labor force was going to be cut off just like the Chinese labor force got cut off in 1882. But they were also aware that there was a exception to the to the ban, and that was that if a Japanese laborer had a wife, uh, the wife was permitted to join the husband in um, the United States. So I'm pretty sure, and, and, and this is speculation on my part, but because this picture is so un unusual that this photograph was taken uh, maybe five or, five or six months before Asano went back to Japan to have her baby and was in effect used as a recruiting tool to encourage more Japanese uh, women from their villages in Wakayama to come to uh, the United States because that would ensure that the existing labor force uh, of young men would, would remain in the winter's area to work and also uh, settle down. Uh, and um, uh, so that was the purpose of this particular photograph. Uh, next slide. But in order to verify this, I, I uh, talked to Heather at Yolo Archives to uh, check the, the property records to see uh, where the Brink Brothers Ranch was to see if it corresponded to the photograph. And uh, if you look at this photograph, the city of Winters is kind of on the right-hand side uh, under the uh, 1900 uh, uh, designation. And the Brink Brothers Ranch is in the middle bottom part of the phot photograph. And it shows that they had 197 acres. And, um, and that's exactly where uh, that photograph would have been taken if it was on the Brink Brothers Ranch. Uh, next slide. So we found our first pioneers, uh, George and Asano Takahashi. And this photograph on the right uh, was taken in 1924. And uh, in the middle, you can see the George Takahashi and to his left, Asano, his wife. And, uh, and then uh, the younger boy was named after his father and was basically George Jr. And the person on the right was named Frank. And Frank is the father of Yasko who supplied the photograph. So, um, I think we've done a pretty good preliminary uh, examination and uh, and uh, has kind of verified the origin and significance of the of that picture, and and we were able to actually identify and find our first uh, pioneer family in Winters. Uh, sometimes they they say if you build it, they will come. And um, I have that same feeling about our exhibit this year, is that the exhibit itself generated more information, more photographs. And uh, this was the pleasant surprise that we received. Uh, next slide. Uh, next, I'm gonna move on to part two and focus in on a photograph that we discovered, that uncovered of the Japanese school that was built in 1930. Okay, so now it's about uh, 29 years later or so uh, after the 1907 picture and um, and it looks like if my supposition is right, Asano's mission to go back to her villages in Wakayama was successful because about 30 years later or 20 years later, uh, this is what the Japanese American community in winners looked like. And, um, 
Uh, the, the thing that's surprising about uh, this photograph, uh, first of all, is that it, it exists at all. And the reason is that uh, because of that Japanese flag uh, that appears in the middle of the picture, because the picture was taken in 1930, but about 11 years later, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, um, uh, you know, there was just mass hysteria on the West Coast, and the FBI was going around arresting anyone who they thought was disloyal. And so uh, I know people in the Japanese American community, they, they burnt tragically, you know, books and letters and photographs and anything that had Japanese writing on it, uh, because these FBI agents, you know, could not read Japanese. And if they saw something, was Japanese writing on it, they thought it was a suspicious item. Um, so obviously a picture with the Japanese flag on it was probably one of the first things that went into the fire uh, at that period. And as archivists, uh, you can feel the tragedy of, of all that uh, important family and community history that was lost in those months right after Pearl Harbor. Now, so the question is, how, why did this one survive? Okay, if, if you look at the picture of the family at the bottom of the slide, uh, that's my grandfather and, and father, uh, Itaru Shimomura and my father, Ben Shimomura, uh, are the two males in the middle. And my grandmother, Sawano, she's to the far left. But the woman to the far right is her younger sister. Now, her younger sister returned to Japan in 1933, three years after this photograph was taken to be married to someone uh, in Wakayama. And when she went back, she took this photograph with her. So the reason why this photograph survived World War II was it wasn't in the United States at all. It was back in Wakayama. And in about 1980, my dad visited Wakayama on a trip and uh, this photograph was given to him uh, and uh, it was brought back to the winner's area. Uh, but I didn't know about this until about five years ago when I was going through some of my mother's photographs after she passed away. And uh, I, I was really amazed when I, I saw this photograph and, um, and uh, knew immediately what its historic value was. And now it uh, has been safely given to Heather at the Yellow Archives, and uh, I think she'll take good care of it. Uh, next slide. Yeah, the, the thing is uh, that um, a picture like this reminds us that, uh, that uh, there's a lot of official paperwork that go into building the school. And one of them is, you know, you have to buy property. And uh, one of the mysteries uh, is of, um, of the school is how could the community build a school like that when the Japanese were prohibited from owning real property? Well, we did a little bit, bit more research and we found out that um, the uh, no Japanese individual bought the property, but it was uh, purchased by a corporate entity. And that corporation was called Kokugo Gakuen and it was incorporated in 1929. Uh, next slide. And it was incorporated as a nonprofit uh, cor corporation. And if you look at its articles of incorporation, one of the first things that it says 
is that uh, the undersigned people who established it were citizens of the United States, okay? And, um, and, so, and they were adults and so that they could do an incorporation. And uh, so it's no coincidence that um, the incorporation happened in uh, 1929 because, uh, you know, after Asano went back to Wakayama in 1907, um, you know, all of a sudden uh, women from her village started coming to uh, Winters, um, you know, through the loophole in the uh, gentleman's agreement. And sure enough, some of the first uh, Nisei children were born in, uh, in um, 1909 and 1908, that period. And, um, and, and so, in 1929, uh, those children would have be become 21 years old. They were American citizens and now they're legal adults. Uh, immediately now they could use the, the system, the American legal system fully as, um, as American citizens and as adults. Uh, next slide. Well, so the school was constructed, um, but as we said, uh, as most of you know, that after Pearl Harbor, uh, all the Japanese on the West Coast, including in winters, were uh, forcibly removed and put in concentration camps uh, in the interior of the country. And uh, they're only permitted to take what they could carry because they, they were put on trains and there was no baggage cars for them. And so this is the photograph of some of the uh, uh, trunks that uh, my parents uh, uh, left and stored in the Japanese school. And um, uh, because uh, that was the only place that they could really keep them in winters, although uh, the Vasey brothers allowed uh, uh, the Japanese to store things in, the, in their old opera house that they owned. They were very kind. Uh, next slide. Also after Pearl Harbor, the Yolo County District Attorney uh, sent out this questionnaire and um, this is another thing that Heather uh, at Yellow Archives found that I, I never knew this existed. But the questionnaire was sent to all Japanese in the county that occupied property. And uh, the Japanese school obviously uh, occupied property. So they had to fill out the questionnaire. Now the questionnaire had maybe about 20 questions on it. But question four asked whether the property was near any strategic works. And you know, the answer was, um, well, we're, we're right across the street from the city's waterworks. And, um, and uh, but then they had this footnote and they wanted to explain that. And they said that since the 10th of December, 1941, that was three days after Pearl Harbor, uh, this, this, the Japanese school board of directors had shut down uh, the uh, school and it hasn't been used for any purpose whatsoever after that. And that it would be closed for the duration of the war, except that when the city of Winters, American Red Cross or a similar organization may put it to some worthy use. And signed by George Tanigo, the secretary treasurer. Um, next slide.
Well, sure enough, uh, something happens that sometimes makes you regret that you wrote something down when maybe you didn't have to volunteer it. But uh, on January 8th, 1943, uh, seven months after persons had been incarcerated, uh, Winters High School burnt down. Okay, and Winters High School uh, needed some place to function. And the, the old Japanese school was only about two blocks away, uh, just east of, of the burnt building uh, on the other side of the railroad tracks in the industrial area. So the Japanese school was commandeered and renamed Victory High School and used for several years uh, after the war. And uh, no rent was ever paid for that. Uh, next slide. But in order to uh, use the Japanese school, they had to do something with all the, the, the baggage and property and, and things that were being stored there. So the school district decided to send all the property to the owners who were in um, these concentration camps. Now, the winners people were sent to two different camps. Those on the Yolo County side, north of Peter Creek, like my parents, were sent to Granada, which is uh, in Colorado. And those that live south of Peter Creek in Solano County were sent to Arizona in to Keela River. Uh, next slide. So this trunk to the left is on display at the Winners uh, uh, Museum currently, and, and, and with little explanations for uh, how it got there and, and how uh, it was stored in the, uh, the uh, old Winners uh, uh, Japanese school. And you could see the family number uh, written on the side, 30980. And that was written by the school district uh, so that it would get to the right person uh, in Colorado. Uh, and so here's a picture of my father at the um, Granada camp. And, um, and uh, this is where they sent the, uh, the trunk. So I, I asked my father, uh, recently because he's 100 years old and still alive and uh, still alert mentally. Um, you know, if you heard about the Winters High School burning down, because I didn't know about that till about four or five years ago myself. And he said, yeah, I heard about it. We heard about it. We read about it in the Winters Express. And I said, well, what did you think? And he said, well, he said, I thought, well, I guess the, they can't blame that one on us. And um, I guess being a thousand miles away in Colorado behind barbed wire was a pretty good um, alibi. The other thing is I, I said, well, weren't you happy that uh, you know, you had to leave all your stuff behind, but now the school's just sent it to you. Um, and again, he said, well, it actually was pretty much useless. He says, because what was in the trunk was, first of all, a lot of cooking things, pots and pans, but then very nice dishes and things that his, his mother had. But he said, we ate in a mess hall, so it was useless to us. And secondly, there were some really nice kimono and Japanese clothes uh, and uh, suits from, uh, from my, his father. But he said, you know, they're, they're all fancy clothes, but there was 
no place to wear it to in the camp because there's no fancy occasions. He said, if we had worn any of that clothes, people would just laugh at us. So he said, all that trunk did was uh, made me feel sad. And I said, why sad? And he said, well, it made me feel like they had just kicked us out of winters seven months ago, and now they don't want us to come back. And that surprised me, that answer. But then I, I started thinking about it, and I thought, well, that would kind of be like, um, like uh, going to college and seven months later opening up your dorm room and seeing all the stuff that you left in your bedroom piled up in, in front of your door. Uh, you get the feeling that maybe home wasn't still home for you anymore. So, um, so the, the story of the Japanese school and the trunk uh, ended up being kind of a sad story. And part of the reason why out of the 100 uh, or 275 people who were uh, taken to the camps from the winners area, 80% uh, of them uh, never returned. And the 20% and only 20% did. So uh, I was fortunate that uh, people like, you know, the Brink brothers actually were uh, as well as the Tufts and uh, some of the other growers, uh, they allowed my uh, parents to come back and resume farming. But for many of the uh, others, the other 80%, they weren't quite so lucky. Um, but I, I don't want to blame the school district people because I, I don't think they intended to send a message like that. But um, uh, in that kind of environment, uh, that's the message that was received. Okay, with that, uh, I think I'll, I'll turn it over to Emily. Thanks, Floyd. All right, so I'm going to be talking about the Sansei, the third generation, and their efforts during the redress movement. This took place in the 1980s. And um, so redress was when uh, the third generation of Japanese Americans was seeking compensation for the wrong done to their families and maybe even themselves if they were in the camps they would have been really young um, because of the incarceration. So next slide please. Okay so we're going to start with Floyd. Um, so Floyd was took, had a really important role in the redress movement and um, we are going to be highlighting him and his contributions, but we do want to acknowledge that it was a team effort. But one reason Floyd was very involved was because he became in 1982 at age 34, the first Sansei national president of the JACL. So the JACL is the Japanese American Citizens League. It's a civil rights organization, a lot like the NAACP, but for Japanese Americans. And prior to him becoming president, there had only been Nisei, second generation uh, people who had this role. So it was a changing of the guard. And on the next slide, I'm gonna talk about why he was elected president. Um, one reason was because he was a law professor and he was an expert in specifically how to obtain money damages from the US government. Um, so the JAC, at the time was pursuing monetary redress for the Japanese Americans who were incarcerated during World War II. And Floyd had the perfect background, the ideal background um, to serve as president. So this is an article he wrote on the history of claims against the United States, looking at um, those monetary claims all the way from colonial times to the then present in the 1980s. And to write this article, he conducted three years of archival research. He did this at the Shields Library uh, here on the campus of UC Davis. And you can see a picture of it on the bottom right hand side. So 
So during the 1980s, there were a series of meetings that happened, kind of building momentum for the movement. Um, one of the first meetings was in Tokyo. This was a meeting with Japanese Prime Minister Nakasone in 1983. So a few days later, um, well, Floyd was meeting with President Nakasone, but in a few days, um, President Reagan was supposed to visit and address the Japanese parliament. So Prime Minister Nakasone turned to Floyd and said, is there anything you'd like me to say to President Reagan? And Floyd said, yes, please ask the president to sign uh, to consider the legislation, the redress legislation that was at that time being introduced to Congress. And um, according to President Reagan's legislative files, um, which were re released about 10 years later, um, it, Prime Minister Nakasone did uh, bring this up with President Reagan and, and lobbied him to sign the redress bill. And this is a photograph from, I believe, a newspaper where Floyd, along with J the JACL's John Tadeishi and Min Yasui, um, he's testifying before Congress. Um, so this was the year after meeting with the Prime Minister of Japan, so in 1984. And then a few months later, he also, um, in the next slide, he uh, met with top White House officials. So you can see him here in the west wing of the White House. He's meeting here with Jack Spahn. This is President Reagan's domestic policy advisor. And they discussed the Japanese American uh, redress legislation and Floyd asked the president to support it. And then four years later, President Reagan does sign the redress bill. So that's August 8th, 1988. It's a big day. Um, and what that legislation provided was an apology and $20,000 in compensation to each Japanese American person who was incarcerated in the camps during World War II. So it was a success. And then jumping forward to 2017, um, so Floyd's redress papers and autograph bills were put into the Smithsonian archives. So you can see here the autographed bills. Those are autographed by Senators Inouye and Matsunaga and by representatives Mineda and Matsui. Um, so those were the four Japanese American members of Congress at the time. And then on the left, you can see Smithsonian curators pictured here. So that's Jennifer Locke Jones and Noriko Sanefuji with the National Museum of American History. You can also see Floyd's family at the exhibit. They had an exhibit similar to the one um, that Winters has currently. And this is Floyd standing quite proudly in front of the Smithsonian. And here's that picture of Floyd again in front of the Smithsonian, but I wanna take us back to 1966 for a moment. Um, this is also a picture of Floyd. He's the person standing off to the left. He was just elected Youth Day Mayor by his peers in Winters when he was attending Winters High School. And this is his uh, Youth Day City Council. So those are also students. So Youth Day, just to give a little context, is a day where the students become the elected officials of the town um, for the day. And there's a parade, lots of festivities. Um, but you can see here Floyd elected president, he's already very politically active. And what this has shown is not only had Winters and other communities shed the prejudices and fears um, that were very much alive during World War II, but someone from a small town can make a big difference in the world. And I think Floyd serves as an inspiration to us all. So with that being said, um, I learned about Floyd and I thought, wow, there's a celebrity hidden in our, in our community and we wanted to invite him when I was a teacher at Winters High School last year to come give a presentation to our sophomore students who were studying World War II at the time in their history classes. So we invited him to come to campus via Zoom and he gave a wonderful presentation, um, some of the information that he presented here. He also talked about his family background um, and his part in the redress movement. And it was very inspiring for our students. And it was our way of persevering perseverance in the community.
Um, so to give you a taste of what that was like, I've included the thank you notes that students wrote Floyd after the presentation. Um, so I've included four here today and I'll read parts of them for you. So this student said, thank you very much for taking the time to talk about what happened to your father. It was very neat how you were able to tell us all that happened and show, showed us amazing pictures. We learned so much about the history of winters and your family and the time you were here with us. I wanted to say thank you for teaching us things about winters and your family. Without this, we wouldn't have known about the community made here and all the hard work your father did. Thank you again for enlightening us with the rich past of your family and our town winters. Another student wrote something similar saying, thank you for coming to our school, sharing your story. Um, I appreciate you being able to tell such a hard life story. We as people can use this information to inform others about the past so we don't make the same mistakes. My class has been learning a lot about World War II and hearing your story has expanded my understanding of the time. Thank you so much for taking the time to come share your experience with us. Another student said that it gave them a better understanding of discrimination issues. Um, and said, I understand that it is not easy to speak out about rough experiences. Listening to you made World War II feel more real. We weren't reading it out of a history book. It was an eye opener. As a future generation, I will stand up for others and make sure history doesn't repeat itself. Thank you for your time. And then just one more. And this student said, thank you for taking time out of your day to describe a very sensitive talk, uh, time. We appreciate the strength and great storytelling. Not everyone has had the privilege we had on Wednesday. We have been learning about World War II and I appreciate you taking the time to inform us more. So he got many of these um, thank you notes and we really did appreciate you coming to, to our class, um, Floyd. Okay, so the last thing that I wanted to mention is what I'm working on um, outside of teaching. I'm, I'm also a writer and I'm also volunteering with the Historical Society of Winters. Um, and what I'm doing is trying to preserve these stories as well. So um, the exhibit for the museum, it's temporary. It'll come down at some point. Um, and I would like to help preserve it through a book project. So I'm working right now on taking uh, digitized files and the captions and compiling it into a book um, that we will print out and have available for the community. Um, and then I also do write fiction. I am a creative writer in a graduate program on the UC Davis campus and I can see great potential for historical fiction. Nothing yet, but um, it's something that I'd like to pursue at some point. And I do wanna finally add that uh, Floyd has really inspired me um, to do some of my own research about my family background. I'm Nisei second generation. Um, I don't have roots in Yolo County, but I do wanna do some digging about my own family and hopefully uncover um, some more history. So thank you. And I will pass it over to Heather. Okay, thank you so much, Emily and Floyd. That was fantastic. Um, oh, I'm gonna mute. Um, yes, thank you so much for your time and your presentation. It was so wonderful to hear about the different ways that you're helping to preserve the story of the Japanese American community in winters. I think it's um, a testament to archives, but also a testament to the collecting and preservation abilities of family members. And um, it's great that you're able to share those stories um, with the younger generation, with students, so that they can understand not only what happened um, nationally, but what's happened in their own communities that they live in today. So um, thank you so much again. Um, at this time, if any of you have questions for Emily or Floyd, feel free to type them into the chat. Um, I do have a couple of questions while we're waiting for other people to um, formulate their questions and send them our way. Uh, and then also, Emily, I think you need to leave in about five or 10 minutes. So if Emily um, leaves, we can still stay and, and Floyd and I will field questions. So um, just in case you see Emily pop off of the, the presentation, that's she's got a class to go to. Um, so um, I wanted to talk a little bit as the, um, since this is kind of part of the archives crawl and also as the, um, the archivist kind of in the room, I was curious, Floyd, if you could chat a little bit about the process of getting your papers into the Smithsonian. Um, I think that that's really exciting and I'm I'm curious to hear about how that happened. He, 
Yeah, I, I, I think the, the secret is that you have to know, but you have to know someone who already works there, who is like your advocate, okay? I, I guess you can just send them stuff and hope that they'll take it. But uh, in my case, I met uh, uh, Noriko, who uh, there, there was a picture of her at a JCL convention about four or five years ago. And she was putting together this exhibit uh, for the Smithsonian. And, uh, but her focus was on World War II and also on the 442nd. Uh, and so she was going around in, at the convention and to other places trying to collect things for, for her exhibit. And I happened to be sitting next to her at a dinner and, um, and uh, she asked me if I had anything. And I said, you know, I, I was born after World War II, so I don't have any experiences or anything about the internment. Uh, but that I, I was involved in the redress campaign. And so we, we talked about that for a few minutes and, and, uh, and, she said, well, we, we don't plan to focus in on redress, but uh, why don't you send me some stuff and we'll um, see what we can do with it. So I sent her a couple boxes of all my papers when I was national JCL president, as well as uh, you know the, the signed uh, redress bills and, and other things and uh, some photographs we had. And, uh, and uh, I asked her if she wanted me to just send her redress stuff or, and she said, no, no, send me everything. You know, all the agendas from your meetings. And, uh, and I said, well, you know, we just talk about other things like our scholarship program or budget or membership or youth program. And, uh, you know, that has really nothing directly related to redress in it. And she said, don't worry about that. She said, a hundred years from now, people are not only, they'll, they'll know what happened in redress, but they're going to wonder how a little organization like yours was able to do it without hiring any fancy lobbying firm in Washington, D.C., or, um, and that, uh, so they would be interested in all the little intricacies of your organization. So, uh, so that's what I did, and six months later, uh, all of this was accepted, and I thought that uh, that was an awful long time, and after about, you know, the first month or two, I kept checking my email and everything, but never heard anything. So I thought, well, maybe it just got lost or they're gonna reject it or something. And, um, but uh, later on, I talked to one of my colleagues, former colleagues at the law school. And, and when I said it, it took six months, he said, that's fast. So, uh, and, and I think the reason is that they have an elaborate process in the Smithsonian. And so, you know, you may have an advocate, but they have to go through a couple different uh, committees and uh, it's, it's pretty thoroughly reviewed. So I was, uh, I, I don't think I really appreciated how valuable those old papers were that I had in my garage, um, but I'm glad I didn't throw them away because uh, I talked to a few other national presidents and because I told them about this and, and they said, oh, we should have saved our papers, but you know, we, we threw them away because you know, they moved two or three times since uh, the campaign was over. So, um, but you know, for archivists, uh, I think this is what you're looking for is uh, actual documents that were written and prepared in time. Yes, absolutely. And I think it's it's wonderful that you had that advocate and that connection to the Smithsonian because it's true. I mean, some of the things that you've created in your life, and I'm speaking to everybody in the room, 
you may not think that it has historic value, but um, it very well could. And especially, I think, I mean, the work that you did was extraordinary and obviously it needed to be preserved, but I think um, sometimes it's good to have a second opinion and have somebody else look at your stuff and see if there's value there. Um, because I think most of us don't see our stories as very special, but, um, but there's definitely, it's definitely special. Um, there is a comment um, from somebody who's watching and she says, thank you Floyd for sharing this part of Winters history. When my family moved to Winters in 1965, our foreman was Charlie, I think it's Hamakawa. Um, I did not realize that he was a community leader for the Japanese community in Winters. So many of our families were touched by the Japanese families and this exhibit opened our eyes to what they went through. Thank you again. Um, so there, that's a comment. Um, a question, it looks like this might be to me, is the Yolo County Archives working to build their own collection surrounding the Japanese slash Japanese Americans who lived in Yolo County? How would people here consider having their family historical documents, photos, ephemera preserved? Um, so the Yolo County Archives are collecting mission. Bye, Emily, thank you. Um, the Yolo County Archives collecting mission and scope is we are the official repository for county records. And then we take in any material that um, really has to do with Yolo County history. So we're not actively collecting Japanese or Japanese American um, history, but we are always open to um, having those types of documents in that record in the collection. As Floyd mentioned, um, he did donate that wonderful panoramic photograph to our collection um, that was taken at the opening ceremony for the Japanese school in winters. Um, so yeah, we're not out in the community soliciting or anything, but we would obviously take anything that um, anyone was interested in giving that's relevant to the history of Yellow County. Um, and then the second part of your question, if you're asking um, how could people consider having their documents preserved um, in their homes, um, there's a couple of ways that you can preserve documents in your own family collections. Um, and I would be willing to give that information maybe in an email that might be easier, but high level, I would say um, one thing that people need to consider is not having photographs in those albums where the picture sticks down. Um, and then also making sure that your paper documents are in the right archival enclosures. So you want to have acid free um, enclosures so that um, it can be preserved. And if you have digital photographs, that's a whole other story. Um, but that's kind of that's high level. I think a lot of people are curious about photographs and things like scrapbooks and newspaper. Um, but yes, yeah, you can shoot me an email. I'll put my email address into the um, chat and you can send me an email um, and I can give you some more specific information. And then if you are concerned about the long term preservation of your materials and it's Yolo County related and you you would like to donate it to us, we obviously can consider bringing it into our collection and preserving it for long term um, and making it available to the public. So um, I'm trying to multitask here, but I'll put my email address and then you can um, shoot me an email if you have a specific question about your particular family items. Um, some more thank yous. Thanks so much, Floyd and Emily. This is a fascinating story of resilience and strength in the face of horrendous unkindness. Please keep sharing this message. Um, and then Sac State, Julie Thomas, the archivist there said Sac State's Japanese American archival collection is always seeking donations from the Sacramento area. So if you have materials that are not Yolo County related, but Sacramento related, um, Sac State would love to have your stuff in the Japanese American archival collection. Um, I did have another question for you, Floyd, um, if you have the time. Um, I was curious, you talked a lot about um, the Japanese American involvement in agriculture, but I was curious when more women started coming over in, you know, after 1907, were they also participating in the agricultural work or were they doing other forms of work in the county? Well, you know, mo most of the Japanese uh, lived out on the farms, uh, not in town. And, and it's because in 1915, Winters became a segregated community and Japanese could only live in one small section of, of town right by the railroad bridge uh, 
which is where the current community center uh, is. And uh, uh, so the, the women wives were dispersed out on the farms and, uh, and you know, really their main job to tell the truth was really to have kids and, and to raise them up. But they did a lot of, you know, farm work, uh, uh, work on the farms, and uh, and they also did a lot of uh, domestic service to the owners in some instances, uh, cooking and cleaning and things like that. Uh, but uh, it really was the coming of the, the Issei women that really brought culture and uh, music and poetry and refinement to the uh, roughneck East Bay boys that came in, you know. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's where the real cultural life of the community uh, came with the women. Thank you so much. And then I was also hoping, I mean, I've heard the story before, but I was hoping you could talk a little bit about what happened in winters uh, post-World War II and when the Japanese, um, that 20% did come back to winters. Well, you know, first of all, one of the reasons, another reason why only 20% came back was that on, on VJ Day, uh, when Japan formally surrendered, uh, there was a big celebration on Main Street. And that night, uh, the small Japantown area that, you know, was right next to the railroad bridge in section four, you know, was burnt down. And so uh, that just happened to be the time when they were uh, closing the camps and people had to make a decision where they wanted to go. So uh that also obviously sent out a negative message to people who were trying to make a decision at that time and um and uh e e and even when my parents came back uh there was signs uh, up uh around city limits to the where uh, it, it said uh, no more japs so um uh but you know, people calmed down after about two or three years. And I was born in 1948. And by the time I went to kindergarten, um, you know, in 1953 or 1954, uh, you know, I, I think people had gotten over this wartime hysteria. And, uh, and uh, so things were a lot better. And, uh, in our exhibit, you know, we not only talk about the bad times, but we do uh, highlight uh, several of the uh, winners' residents who refused to sign the petitions, you know, in keeping the Japanese out, and actually invited the Japanese back onto their farms to resume, resume their, uh, you know, the work there. So. Um, you know, in, in winters, I, I think really the growers actually, you know, they, you know, they're interested in having labor and, and qualified labor. And so uh, they, they never really were advocates of kicking everybody out. They, they always felt like that was uh, overkill, you know. And, um, but really it, it's, it, it's more the other laborers, other, uh, labor from and um, and then people who had um, you know when, when the Japanese left other people came in and took over their uh, jobs and their positions on the farm and and so you know they had an economic interest in not having the Japanese come back because they felt that they might be displaced again so um, so, but, but, you know, after that immediate period, four or five years, uh, things went back more to, to, to normal. And I had a good experience in grammar school and in high school, you know, like you pointed out, uh, uh, 
I was elected youth day mayor, but actually before me, uh, another one of my brother's friends was elected youth day mayor. And two years after me, uh, 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 a person named Stanley Cotto uh, from the Cotto family was elected youth day mayor. So, uh, and uh, another person from the Cotto family um, was elected student body president in like 1958 or so. So, uh, you know, things changed and, and uh, you know, I think one of the stories, uh, bylines or lessons that I have is that, you know, when people are scared, particularly when the, uh, they're afraid that uh, they're going to be invaded. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, good people do bad things, and and it's usually, uh, you know, when they feel threatened. And uh, so, uh, you know, once the threat w went away, I, I think a lot of the animosity kind of melted away at the same time. And uh, but you know, my parents never talked about it, or even. Uh, you know, some of my 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 friends' parents, um, you know, they never talked about it either. So it's it's kind of like people just decided that they're going to face the future and let's not think about that bad thing that happened. Um, so uh, that's why I, uh, you know they say ignorance is bliss, and so I I was pretty blissful until I went to UC Davis and actually learned about what really did happen so um. right well and to your point and I know you didn't speak about it much in this presentation but the expertise that the Japanese Americans had in the pruning of the trees I'm sure that a lot of the growers wanted to have that expertise back after the war yeah the you know um the Japanese have always been good with knives and scissors and and pruning shears. You know, I I don't know why, but um, uh, you know, they, uh, it probably came out of their history of making swords and things like that. But they're very good at that. But uh, and, and also their gardening. Uh, uh, if you've ever been to a Japanese garden, they try and make it look natural, but it's really very unnatural in a way. But the way they prune and uh, everything is um, pretty marvelous. And if you see the little bonsai uh, plants that they have, uh, uh, where they just snip, snip, snip. And uh, I mean, some of those are like 50 or 60 years old. You know, so the patience that goes into that uh, you know, they really learn how to uh, work with nature, and uh, uh, and and that had something to do with uh, the, the, their whole method of pruning. They they knew how to prune, you know, technically how to cut branches and everything, so that it uses the the least amount of effort. Yeah. And they kept their uh, pruning shirt very sharp and and. Uh, because I used to to uh, watch the the people came to prune on our farm, and I always felt like they were like great swordsmen, and and they all had their own e equipment, their little knives and pruning shears, the big ones and smaller ones, and but the way they handled it was uh, just amazing how that they could uh, go up that ladder and um, and do pruning, but. You know, talking about pruning is that Professor Tufts, who was one of our neighbors who helped us come back, was head of the palmology department at UC Davis. And uh, so he uh, attacked pruning from a, a scientific standpoint about how to shape the tree and all that. Uh, so, but, but technically, you know, he worked with the Japanese pruners, and they came up with something called the the, the winter's method of pruning apricot trees. And uh, 
uh, it was a combination of science and uh, and also kind of learned skilled from Japan. So, uh, so you know, you know, we always talk about the meeting of East and West, and it's done on this big macro level. But in winters, it really was this. Uh, relationship between the Brink brothers and other farmers in the area and a very small part of Wakayama because almost everybody came from maybe two villages that were only like two miles apart. And uh, so it really was the tale of, of two little towns, you know, who uh, for a lot of accidental reasons, they bonded and they had this mutual interest that for about you know 50 or 100 years uh, was very productive i think on both sides yeah it's so interesting um it looks like we have one final question floyd if if you have some time so um sure. this person says thank you so much for this presentation did splitting the japanese american community of winters into two different internment camps based on county of residents have lasting ramifications after World War II. I don't know if you've run into any stories about that. Um, well, I, I think it was, it, it was sad that it, 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 it was done that way. But, uh, you know, when you have a situation where 80% of the people don't come back, but, you know, of the 20 that did, it was pretty even on both sides. Uh, I don't think that the fact that, uh, you know, half went to Arizona and half went to Colorado, uh, you know, was the big, uh, made any big difference. Uh, but it, it does show the, uh, the way the military does things. If there's no finesse to it. You know, they just look at a map and they say everybody on one side goes here and people on the other side go someplace else. And, you know, there's no exceptions. That's just the way that, you know, they did things. But, you know, ironically, from the redress standpoint, the one good thing that the military does is it takes, keeps very good records of everybody. Their name, their camp number, the day they walked into camp, the day they went out, where they came from, where they signed out to. And uh, so when it came to finding the people who were incarcerated, I mean, it, it was very, it, it was a very easy thing to contact people and then to verify whether you're in camp or not in camp. So, um, so, so sometimes the system works for you and sometimes it doesn't. Well, and to plug archives, that's probably an archival record that you were looking at to try to get <laughs> <Yeah>. that information. <laughs> um, okay, well, thank you so much for your time, Floyd, and we'll say thank you to Emily again, even though that she left a little bit early. Thank you so much, and I hope you guys have a great rest of your day and weekend. Thank you.